Welcome back to McMaster University course, Computer Science and Software Engineering 2FA3, Discrete Mathematics with Applications 2. Today we're going to continue then with the topic of Turing machines and computability. And we're going to start today by introducing the notion of a Turing machine, which is one of the most important ideas that has ever been presented in all of science. So let's start off with an informal description of a Turing machine. So a Turing machine has three things. It has a tape, and a tape has cells in which we can uh, write symbols, and this tape has a beginning point on the left, but it has no ending point on the right. And at any given moment, the tape contains a bunch of symbols, but at some point, it will have blank symbols that will go on forever. It also has a state, uh, a set of states, and the, the machine is in one of these sets of states at any point, and it has a program, which is a transition function. So this tape is two-way, read-write, semi-infinite. Two-way means we can move back and forth either direction on this. We can read symbols and we can write symbols and it's semi-infinite in the sense that there's no end if we go to the right. Uh, the input string is always going to be a finite st string. So here this could be the input string. It's finite. At any given uh, moment in the processing of the machine it will hold a finite string uh, that will then be followed by an infinite set of blank symbols. So the, the tape we can think of as unbounded sequentially accessed memory. So unbounded means we can have as much memory as we want and it's sequentially accessed means we get to any point by moving steps to the right or steps to the left. Now, the program is deterministic. That means if we have a current state, state symbol, like we're looking at this symbol, and um, we have a particular state, the transition function will move us left or right. It will uh, change possibly the symbol and um, that's it. That's all it will do. And we'll move to a new, a new uh, state. Now, here's the formal definition. And this is a definition for a deterministic one-tape Turing machine. And there's many kinds of Turing machines. Some are inde indeterministic. Some have multiple tapes. But for us, we're going to use a definition of a Turing machine that's deterministic, has one tape, and this definition follows Cozen's book. And like our other machines, it's presented as a tuple. So we have Q, which is a finite set of states. We have sigma, which is our input alphabet gamma, which is our tape alphabet, which includes all the members of sigma. And then we have a left end marker. That's going to be a symbol, which is in our tape alphabet, but it's not a member of sigma. And we have some kind of blank symbol. We have our transition function, which is right here. It takes a state. It takes a member on the tape and it produces a new state, possibly overwrites the member that was on the tape, and then it moves either left, the tape head moves left or right. And then we have a start state, the state we start in, and a accept state and a reject state. And delta can be almost anything. Delta, we're very free what delta can be. 
The only requirements are if we're in some state and we're looking at the left end marker, we must not overwrite the left end marker and we must move right. So whenever we get to the left end marker, we have to leave it there and then move right. And the other, so that's one condition. The other condition says that once we're in the accept state, we, say, we stay in the accept state. We can't ever get out of it. And what the machine does, doesn't matter. It just keeps running. We stay in that state. If we end up in the reject state, we stay in the reject state. And what we do when we're in the reject state doesn't matter. Okay, so let's look at an example. I'll tell you ahead of time that this example is an example of a Turing machine. And it's going to accept this language, a to the m, b to the n, when m and n are natural numbers. And so we have four states, s, q, t, and r. And our input alphabet has two symbols, a and b. And our output alphabet has the symbols a and b, plus the left end marker, plus the blank. And so this table tells us exactly what delta does. The first thing to notice is that remember when we're reading, so if we're in one of these states and we're reading the left end marker, then we have to, we can change the state to whatever we want, but we must preserve this marker. That's what this means. And we go right. And so if we're in the start state, we're going to stay in the start state. Uh, if we're in our, the state Q, it doesn't matter where we go because we're never going to get in this situation where we're in state Q looking at the left end marker. And of course, if we're in the accept state or reject state, we stay in those states. And notice we put these dashes, meaning it doesn't matter what we put here. We can put whatever we want. Uh, so the important things about the accept state and reject states, once we're in them, we stay in them. And so, so basically, uh, the real key of what's happening is in states S and Q. And so state S, what it does is we're looking for an A. And so if, we see, if we're in state S and we see an A, we go to the right and we stay in S. If we end up seeing a B, then we go to state Q. And in state Q, if we see any A's, we reject. If we see a Q, I, I'm, excuse me, if we're in Q and we see a B, then we move to the right. And if, we, if in either state we get see a blank, then we accept. So basically, think of it this way, we're going to start with Let's see, we're starting with AABB, and then we have a bunch of blanks here. So we start here in state S, and then in state S, we're reading, a, we're reading this. We're going to keep this thing the same, and we move to the right. So we're here in state S, and then we read an A, we keep the A there, we move this way, and then we get, we, 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 we read this A, and then we move here again to the right. But now um, we're still in state S, and now in state S we're reading a B, and now we go to Q. And in Q, we're reading a B, we go to the right. And we're in, um, we go to the right, and now we're in uh, state Q. And now we have a, uh, a blank, and in state Q, what do we do? We go to the accept state. So we accepted this. Now, if we, if we had something different, let me use a different color, if we had, let's say, 
and A here, what we'd be happy when we got here in state Q and we're reading an A, then we would go to the reject state. Okay, so that's example one. This is very simple. And notice that we're, we're using a Turing machine, which is a very powerful machine, to simulate a finite automaton. Because, as you know, this language, this language here, is regular. Okay, so I have a question. A Turing machine will either accept or reject an input stream. Is this statement true or false? I'll give you a moment to think about it and come up with an answer. Okay, well, welcome back. The answer is false. Because a Turing machine, if you give it an input, there's three possibilities. It, ex it can accept, it can reject, and it can loop. Looping means it just runs forever. This is different from the other kinds of automaton, automata that we've seen. The other kinds, like finite automata and push down automata, they either accept or reject. But Turing machines have a third possibility, they can loop. Okay, so let's think of what a configuration is. A configuration is going to be a triple. It's the state we're in. It's what's ever on the tape. And what's ever on the tape will be a finite string of tape symbols followed by an infinite string of blank symbols. Now, um, Y could also include blank symbols, but eventually we're going to have an infinite string of blank symbols. Now, the this thing that looks like a W is really omega. And omega is the first infinite or ordinal. So we're using omega here to represent infinity. And then finally, we have N is where the tape head is. Where the, so if we have our tape like this, at some point, so if we index these like this, the tape head is pointing at that point. And so a configuration describes our machine in state Q with tape contents Z and the rewrite head is at position N. And configurations are denoted by Greek letters and the start configuration looks like this. We're in the start state, whatever that is for our Turing machine. We have always the left end marker. We have our input string and then we have an infinite string of blank symbols. And we're, we're, uh, the tape head is pointing to the first position. That will be right here, which will always be the left end marker. OK, so then we can define the next configuration relation, how we get from one configuration to the next. It's, it's pretty simple. If we're in state P, and we're in state P and we're uh, looking at a string Z. And there is a transition that says for P and the symbol, the symbol at the nth position in Z, if, if, if we have a transition for that, well, we, we will. I'll have a transition for every possibility here. But the symbol at the nth position in Z, we'll use that transition to go to a new state. We will rewrite the symbols at, that, at the nth position with B, and we will move left. So that's what this says. We'll go to the new state Q. We will substitute into our string. We will basically replace at the nth position. We will replace whatever is there by B. And then we will move the, the uh, tape head backwards to the left one. And if we have right, everything's the same except we move forwards one. 
And then we can define these relations just as you've seen before. And there's nothing really new there. Okay, so we need to introduce some more definitions. Our machine accepts a string if we start off with that string on the tape, x. So we're trying to accept x, it's on the string. And we eventually get to a accept state, uh, the accept state. And it doesn't matter what's, what's here and here. It doesn't matter this part. What matters is that we get to the accept state. And we reject if we start the same way, but we end up with in the reject state. And it halts if it either accepts or rejects, and it loops if it neither accepts nor rejects. And loops, let me repeat, is just what it sounds like. The machine would just keep going from state to state, moving around the tape, doing a lot of things, but it will not, never stop. And we say M is total if it halts in all inputs. And the language of M is a set of strings accepted by M. And a language is called recursively enumerable if the language is accepted by some Turing machine. And it's recursive if it's accepted by some total Turing machine. So if we think of all the RE languages like this recursively enumerable language, it contains the set of recursive languages. And these are sitting in the big space of all possible languages. Uh, okay, so let's look at one more example. Um, this is an example for a non-context-free language. It's a to the n, b to the n, c to the n, when n is greater than or equal to zero. And we know that this is non-context-free because we have talked about how you can use the pumping lemma for context-free languages to show that this is non-context-free. It is accepted by a Turing machine. It's accepted by this Turing machine M. Therefore, this language is recursively, it's recursively enumerable. Because all languages except by Turing machines are recursively enumerable. And this is defined in, on page 212 in Cozen's book. Um, we have a start state, then 10 other states, and we have the accept state and reject state. We have just these three um, input symbols, and we have an extra uh, tape symbol, the right end marker. So how does this work? Well, the way this works is it first, so, so we're gonna start off with some string and we're hoping the string looks like this. And so the first thing we do is our machine keeps reading A's, and when it gets done, it reads B's, and then when it gets done, it reads C's. And if it get, finds any, you know, if after reading A's, it finds some B's and A's, it's going to reject. But if it reads that there's just A's and followed by B's and followed by C's, it will put this marker at the end. And then, so that's what it would do number two, then it will, it will go back and forth. And each time it goes back, it will start with an A and it will replace an A it finds with the blank symbol then it will look for a B and replace it with a blank symbol. Then it will look for a C and replace it with a blank symbol. Then it will go back to the left again and do this over and over again. And if it's able to succeed and there's no more A's, B's, and C's, then it accepts. In any other situation, it rejects. Okay, so that is our second example. We're going to stop here. And next time, we're going to spend some more um, time on the difference between recursively enumerable and recursive sets. So we'll see you then.